Okay. Well, I'm, uh, we have another 30 seconds. <laughs> Started. Uh, his undergraduate at uh, BU and at Yale in psychology, has masters uh, from Cambridge College in counseling psychology. We of course know him as you know one of the foremost authorities on undue influence, meaning mind control, and destructive authoritarian people and cults. He's a certified counselor. Uh, he's the author of several really well-known books. Uh, I see some of them here. I don't know if you have the one. The one I was releasing the bonds. Is that up there? Nope. That's an awesome book from a while back. Thank you. But I do recommend that. That was the one in between. Okay, right. It's a little bit older. This is the updated, shorter version. Okay, fair enough. Um, but uh, he's also found director of the Freedom of Mind Resource Center. It's a counseling and publishing organization that's dedicated to helping people become psychologically empowered, upholding human rights, promoting consumer awareness, exposing abuses of undue influence. He's a developer of a curriculum designed to educate and empower set tracking trafficking victims, and of course, as a leading expert, not surprising, he's a much sought after speaker, both in popular media, pretty much all the news organizations, 60 Minutes, CNN, et al., uh, government, government organizations, and of course, academic meetings. So we feel very thrilled that you're here uh, speaking to us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Is it, uh, it, you don't need to clap. Um, <laughs> but I want to thank my mentor, uh, Dr. Gutile, for saying you need to do Grand Rounds, so thank you. I think I did it about 15 years ago, but not in this particular building or room. And on a personal note, I'd just like to say that my associations with uh, the center was when I was being treated for Hodgkin's lymphoma 11 years ago. And thanks for helping me. So. I'm going to go really fast. I have a website. I have YouTube videos of other longer presentations. I'm a member of the Harvard Program in Psychiatry and the Law, which is how I know Dr. Gutile, Dr. Roth, and others, because I have a profound interest in not only educating mental health professionals, but also changing the legal system in terms of understanding all the developments that have happened about the mind and social psychology and hypnosis. So very briefly, this is just an intro and we're talking about me teaching a two one and, a two one and a half hour uh, courses in the, in the spring and then maybe doing a, uh, an actual longer course uh, for the medical school next year. I'm gonna just jump ahead and say I'm a he wounded healer. I was recruited into a cult when I was 19 in college, which when I was deprogrammed out of that cult, and Robert J. Lifton's book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, was used in my intervention, the bells went off as it was about Chinese communist brainwashing. But everything the cult that I was in, which was the Moonies, uh, were in those eight criteria. And when I met with him and he said, you know, I've just studied it secondhand, but you've lived it, and they did it to you, and you did it to other people, so you should study psychology and explain it to people like me. And I was like, uh, 22 years old, college dropout, distinguished Yale psychiatrist saying, I have something to contribute. So you're meeting me 41 years later. This has been 41 years full-time work. Uh, and it's not moving. That's not a good sign. Help. <laughs> Tel tech. Uh, okay, I'm going to do it on that one. So in the, D the DSM-5 and the 4 and the 3 had a catch-all category of a dissociative disorder uh, and the terminology about cults and and mind control, brainwashing, thought reform was the term Dr. Lifton preferred, uh, is actually got a number. Um, let's go forward. So 
So I'm here to state that I believe that the problem of unethical influence is epidemic and that, uh, that mental health clinicians are not, are not trained to, when they're doing histories, uh, identify what could be the, the root problem of their clients. So I'm going about to tell you about a client of mine that I had. Um, I'm going to skip ahead and just talk about Laura for a minute. She called me up, said, I read Combating Cult. Oh, I have no disclosures except that I wrote some books and I have now a, a nonprofit division <laughs> to trying to raise money to develop more research and publications in this field. That's my disclosures. So Laura called me up, said, I read Combating Cult Mind Control. You wrote about the church that I was in, and I'm wondering if you can help me. I said, tell me. She said, I was in the Boston Church of Christ, which is what we call a shepherding discipleship cult. It actually started in Lexington, Massachusetts in 1979, and I started helping people out of that group in 81. Anyway, I wrote about it in my book. And she said, I was a leader in it for 13 years, and I've been in and out of psychiatric hospitals for 11 years, uh, and I still have urges to cut myself and hurt myself and kill myself, and I think a demon is trying to uh, harm me. Can you help me? So I said, tell, let me talk to your psychiatrist, let me talk to your psychologists, and she basically came up to Boston and I worked with her for 24 hours over a five day period of time, which is out of the box of what we would normally think about seeing somebody. But I was working with her three hours in the morning, hour and a half lunch, three hours in the afternoon, psychoeducation about destructive mind control cults, helping her understand What's the difference between ethical influence and unethical influence? It's the difference between a healthy church and a, a Bible cult, uh, and helping her process her experiences. And I had to go back in time to when she was first recruited and helped her realize she did not have informed consent. She had no idea what this group was about or what was going to happen to her that they were going to put her in an abusive marriage and she would have to be submissive to her husband as one tiny example. Um, yeah, so I worked with her and I have another video but I'm scared to try to put it on but it, I have a link and a password which is a non-blur vision of her talking about her maltreatment and misdiagnoses by the mental health system it's on my website, you just need to contact us, we can give you the link and the password to see the non-blur. But she was literally on a list of medications this long, and after my work with her, she was titrated off. She didn't need to be on anything, and she didn't have symptoms anymore. And, and so um, the power of this work is so uh, re revolutionary, but it requires, it, it would have required one of her practitioners to say, tell me about the church. Why did you leave it? What's the name of the church? Who founded it? Go on Google. Put the name of the church, then plus the name of the cult leader, plus cult, plus brainwashing, plus ex-members. They would have found article after article, web page after web page, by former members to identify it as an unhealthy group, uh, mind control group. They didn't do that. They even told her she should call up her church friends and get some support at, at points in her treatment, which boggles my mind, but I'm sure the, the therapists were all very well intentioned, thinking they were doing the logical thing, except they didn't understand the nature of the psychological problem which was she had a dual identity. She had a split in her psyche, the cult identity and who she was before. And the cult identity is programmed to keep the person aligned, obedient, submissive, and I'll get into specific programming techniques 
And by the way, I, I'm going to talk very briefly so we can have interaction and do questions and answers. So because I stated I would talk about the differences of defined brainwashing and mind control, here's the slides to do that. I, the term brainwashing, it, it's not a great term. It's used all the time. But it, in its more political context, when it was first coined in the 50s by Edward Hunter, it really had to describe much more about people who were being coerced, people who were being imprisoned, people who, at least at the beginning of the process, looked at the agents of influence as malevolent or trying to harm them or change them. Uh, and a Patty Hearst would, would fulfill that, who was kidnapped out of her apartment, versus what most destructive mind control cults are doing these days, especially through the internet, is what I call mind control. It's not a great term, but it's, um, at least for the people that I've worked with over 40 years, they like it in terms of their minds were taken over by an external um, uh, uh, force and organization that put in a whole new personality. So it's more subtle, you, you kind of look at your agents of influence as your friends, your teachers, your mentors, maybe your girlfriend, your boyfriend. So the guard, the, the walls of protection are lowered and there's more of a sense of participation. And so mind control is more of a bi-directional process where the person is telling about their background, the manipulator is using that information to to tune in to what's going to be more effective for the person. And the person has that illusion of choice and illusion of control. And so it's very tricky to um, help them. This is in the news almost every day. In my opinion, it fits the criteria of a destructive cult. Trafficking also, I've done some trainings for law enforcement. I've developed a curriculum as uh, was mentioned before for survivors to understand. This book is sold on Amazon. It teaches people how to be a pimp and how to brainwash the hose. I'm not kidding. And what I say to law enforcement, these people are studying the techniques of hypnosis and brainwashing and, and doing it on people and we the do-gooders of the planet are ignorant about what they're doing. And we have to learn, and we have to understand, and we have to help our people get better. So this, I used to say 40 years ago, is the $64,000 question. I'd say it's the $5 million question now with inflation. But how would you know if you were under mind control, or how would anyone know if they were under mind control. And now I'm going to ask for answers. And anyone who's read my books, don't, answer, don't raise your hand. Yes? Overdrawn idea, constant, uh, no matter what you say, they've got a consistent uh, line of um, talk. Right, so I'm in a cult. I don't think I'm in a cult. My family thinks I'm in a cult. My friends think I'm in a cult. My former teachers think I'm in a cult. But I'm, I know that I'm thinking for myself and making my own decisions. How am I going to know? What, how, what can I do to reality test that? Any thoughts? You can't. So the, 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 the thing is, is I have a process where you can. I'm going to tell it to you right now because of time. But if you're interested in this subject, it's going to take a learning curve to actually learn more of the nuts and bolts than I can cover in a one hour talk. But essentially, you would need to get away from the context or the influencer or the group. No contact, no text messages, no calls, no rituals that you were taught to do. Take a break, take a vacation, one week. No contact with the, the group that is being raised as the concerning group. Then study models of mind control. The, the, the three top models uh, is Lifton's eight criteria that he wrote about in Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, Margaret Singer, both studied, 
Both were military intelligence in the 50s during the Korean War. She has six conditions. I took their model and I created the BITE model. Behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. And you should have it in, in handouts or email handouts. It's on my website as well, but study that as the template. Then talk to critics and talk to former members. Because one of the attributes of a destructive mind control group is they poison people against the other side. Don't talk to those ex-Scientologists, they're all biased. Don't talk to those ex-Moonies, don't talk to, they're bad people, that's pornography, don't, don't read that. No, if, start with the assumption, I'm an intelligent person, if something is legitimate, it will stand up to scrutiny. Let me hear what the criticisms are. Let me hear what the former leaders want to share in terms of what their experiences were. So that's a major step. Another major step is honest self-reflection. Going back in time when you first heard the group, which is very tricky if you were born in a group, and that's a whole other uh, complex uh, issue we can talk about, but right now I'm just talking about people who are recruited deceptively into a cult, but actually reflect back to the first thought, the first time of the group was mentioned, what did you think? What were you, what was being represented? It's often a, a volleyball game, or let me help you study for your math test, or somebody flirting with you thinking they want, they're interested in you, which is what happened to me. Three women were flirting with me after my girlfriend dumped me were flirting with me, it's like, and I even asked them, are you part of a religious group? And they said, oh no, not at all. And I somehow asked that question, so something was going on in the back of my mind. In any case, reflect over your experiences honestly from an observer perspective, using the grid of the bite model, for example, using the information from former members and critics, and then honest reflection. Were you subjected to a mind control regime? And usually people wake up and go, oh my God, I thought the leader was crazy, or oh my God, I felt like they were brainwashing me. And it's like, aha. So you, your, your authentic self identified that, but you didn't get up and walk out and then we teach them about social conformity and social pressure and how polite people don't get up and walk out on lectures. But if you're in a mind control recruitment scenario, that's your only survival move. So I gave this in the handouts and this is a way of organizing your thoughts. And it's a continuum, it's not a perfect um, model, but I'm hoping to develop it and ultimately with, with the program in psychiatry and the law, develop a model that expert witnesses can use to determine in any particular case the level and extent of undue influence or mind control that was exerted on a person. So honesty, informed consent, conscience, love, good checks and balances, deception, conditional love, Totalist ideology, black and white, us versus them, good versus evil, authoritarian structure. Basically in the dual identity, the cult identity is obedient to the leader or the ideology and suppresses the person's conscience and will as evil or, or um, fallen or whatever. This is another important graphic because most people in mind control groups are in the circles emanating from the base of the pyramid. They're not living in a commune, wearing a uniform. They're having jobs, and, 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 uh, but nevertheless being indoctrinated and not able to look at anything critical or talk to ex-members, even if it's their brother or sister. Anyone come across the Jehovah's Witnesses? When my book first came out in 1988, I started getting letters from former witnesses who said, I loved your book, it was incredible. How come you didn't mention Watchtower? And I said, why? 
are they a cult? And they're like, oh, I underlined the entire book. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a group that fulfills this, the criteria, the bite model to, to the <coughs> maximum extent. Oh, I see you have people over there, sorry. Um, everything from corporal punishment and beating young children Till they're, till they're bleeding in some cases, withholding blood transfusions, uh, indoctrinating phobias about Armageddon, uh, shunning and disfellowshipping where you can't even talk to your own mother or your brother or your sister or your wife has to dissociate from you because you are not a believer anymore. So that's a, that, that they have seven million people in that group. So it's not obvious. Oh, yeah, that, this is personal. So who remembers the Moonies? All the people with gray hair. All the young people are like, huh, what the Moonies? What are they? And it's like, that was the big cult in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I fasted for Richard Nixon during Watergate because God said he wanted him to be pre you know, president even though I had hated Nixon and fought with my parents before I was recruited into the cult. And he's best known in the, in the Guinness Book of Records for these mass weddings where he would line up the men and women and go, you and you, you and you. And you'd have five minutes to decide if you accept God's advice for the sinless marriage. And all the dresses were identical and all of the suits, this was the, group that I was in for two and a half years. I would literally bow with my head to the floor when he entered the room. He, the cult still owns the Washington Times newspaper. Here he was being crowned the Messiah in the Senate office building. He died in 2012, and there's a fight between several of his sons and, and the true mother over the $4 billion empire. So I'm just gonna quickly go through the bite model. I created this model based on Festinger's cognitive dissonance theory that says we have thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. You change one, it, alter, it alters the others to reduce dissonance. It's the penultimate model for understanding how we learn and how we can change in a good way, in an ethical way, or an unethical mind control way. Somebody read the, the uh, handouts and said, how come you have meditation and prayer and chanting as a mind control technique? And I said, ah, good question. I said, I pray and I meditate and I chant. I belong to a temple in Brookline, Jewish temple. They said, but you have it as a mind control technique. I said, aha, the difference is that if the locus of control is in you and you're using it as a technique for centering your own mind, for your own beingness or to get out of your thoughts, to be in your core, it's ethical. If it's being used, uh, if you're being told meditate, do a TM meditation whenever you have a bad thought or a bad feeling about Maharishi, then it's a thought stopping technique, a behavior modification technique that's used to um, interrupt reality testing and harm people. <coughs> So the worse the group is, the more extreme a lot of these are. Obviously, if you can get someone to an isolated place, control their sleep, control their diet, control their food, <coughs> regulate uniforms, uh, 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 they, uh, make them financially dependent, make them do uh, rituals, make them ask permission, never let them alone, privacy deprivation. Uh, it's bad news. I would go back and just say in ISIS they have people killing people as a cognitive distance technique to get their cult identity more enforced quickly. Because once somebody shoots somebody in the head, whether it's their own relative or somebody else or cuts their head off, uh, there's a lot of dissonance going on for their real self and their real conscience. So it, it speeds the uh, creation of the cult identity. So information is the tools we use to think. And if you control the information, you can control thought, and you can control feelings and behaviors. <coughs> so key point is lack of informed consent, 
outright deception, lots of propaganda, fake news, fake news, fake news. Um, I have blogs that you may be interested in reading. I won't tell you my political bias at all. Wink, wink. Um, but information is used against spying, creating manipulated uh, mystical experiences. Oh, I had a dream about you last night. Not telling you I talked to your partner and you had told the partner your dream, but now you think that I can read your mind. And because I'm a leader in the cult, uh, you know, you go, wow, he wouldn't lie because you're the leader in the cult. But guess what? They lie all the time. Cult leaders. Because the ends justify the means is the mentality. We have the God, we have the truth. Uh, use of confession. So thought control, loaded language is a very important concept. Reality gets redefined into these, uh, what, what Lifton described as thought terminating cliches. Um, and I was just on with a, with a, um, uh, a, a former member of a, of a cult, and it, when they're out for years, but they're still using the jargon of the cult, it's one of the first things I say, hey, you need to get control of your mind, get control of your language, get control of your thoughts, and stop using what they, how they define things. And one of the most um, obvious examples I'd like to just do a quick tangent on is when I first was meeting uh, sex trafficking survivors and people who were helping them, they would describe it as, how long were you in the life? And I was like, who came up with in the life? Well, I don't know, but that's what it's called. I'm like, that's what pimps want to call it. That's not a life. It's called slavery. It's called sexual bondage. You, you do not want to keep using pimp mind control loaded language if you want to help a trafficking survivor, you want to explain this concept, explain how it fits in all these other contexts, and help them understand uh, that there is hope and that they can reclaim their, their lives and their identities. Um, I'm going to shoot, I'm looking at the time and I really want to engage you in questions and answers, so I know you have a lot, you better, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, Emotional control, affect manipulation. Oh, you're so special. Oh, just meeting you is such an honor. And those types of pump the person up, make them feel like you know the, the whole world is, is gonna be helped and served by them. Also buttering the person up, that's powerful. But most of the manipulation, once you get into the cult and you're getting programmed, is about guilt manipulation and fear manipulation. The universal mind control technique is phobia installation. The inculcation of irrational fears that if you leave the group or if you question the leader, terrible things are gonna happen to you. In other words, if someone has, a, I'm just gonna switch for a second. If someone has a, a deep phobia about elevators, they can't imagine getting in an elevator, riding safely and comfortably. All they can generate are fearful scenarios of being trapped for eternity or plummeting out of control and dying very messily. They can't see it. Once they can imagine riding safely and comfortably, it opens up that option as a choice. So what happened to me when I was in the Moonies, this nice middle-class Jewish kid from New York? I was taken to see the Exorcist movie by the cult. It came out in 1974 when I was recruited. I watched the Exorcist movie with 200 other Moonies. We were then bussed up to Tarrytown, and Moon gave a lecture about how God made the Exorcist. And this movie was a prophecy of what would happen if people left the Unification Church. And as stupid and crazy as that idea is, I was sleeping three to four hours a night. I was totally disorganized in my ability to think critically. And I accepted that installation of that fear. And for the rest of my membership, 
the moment I would have a doubt or something, it was Satan trying to invade me, some invisible entity that I needed to pray and purify myself in order to follow um, orders. And I was literally trained to die on command or kill on command, but I was a leader. And I was just at the State Department, a Ralph Bunch Library on 9-11, and I said, when I first saw the planes going into the World Trade Center, my first thought was, I would have done that. And it's a horrifying thought. But it's also what's propelled me for 41 years. Because if it could happen to me, where I had question authority, remember those bumper stickers from the 70s, question authority, with the ponytail and the work boots and the jeans, if I could be praying for Nixon to be president or I could murder strangers because I was ordered to, because God told me to, I'm telling you, it can happen to other people and it has happened to millions of people. The good thing is phobia, phobias are one of the fastest things that you can cure. I actually have a three-step phobia intervention in the Freedom of Mind book. That's a shameless plug for that. And I, I'm wrapping up. Uh, we have, actually, I want to talk a little bit more about therapy. I'm going to try to do it in five minutes so we have lots of time for questions and answers. But don't think of cults as people with robes in a commune. Just think different contexts. Think of unethical behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control made to make people dependent and obedient with a dissociative disorder. <clears throat> Most of your patients are not going to come in and say, I was in a cult. They're not going to, you know. If you're lucky, like I was, Laura said, I read your book and you named my group. <laughs> but uh, they're going to come in with all kinds of symptoms and it's going to be up to you to do your due diligence and ask some questions. But these are some of the symptoms that are very, of course, PTSD. Guilt, fear, sleep disorders, eating disorders, sexuality issues. So there's a, there's a cult called the Children of God that lead, called themselves the family. The leader was a pedophile, and he had the women become happy hookers for Jesus. And the instructions was to love children uh, to age two or three and have sex with children. Uh, and um, horrible cult, horrible abuse. And what we're seeing are people raised in these cults surfacing and they don't know who they are and they don't fit because they didn't have it, normal education, normal socialization. And uh, they often will get into trafficking situations or drug situations or criminal gang situations because they don't know what to do. They don't have choices. Um, Lack of trust is the universal issue, even with people that I've worked with who left 30 years ago or 40 years ago. They don't trust themselves in a very core way when they don't trust others. So many of them never got into a, a committed relationship or committed to a career path because of trust. Uh, and there is techniques for, for rebuilding trust. With the religious cults, people often identify with the term, I felt like I, my soul was raped. Not just once, for years. And now they're coming out and it's um, a process to rebuild. So I believe in the concept of an authentic self that we're born with in our DNA. And we can have all kinds of philosophical debates on my idealism, but it works for me. And it works in terms of my population to say to someone who's born in a cult, I believe there's a core authentic self that knows love for, from uh, faux love or manipulation or conditional love, that knows truth, that wants people to be honest, doesn't want to be abused, doesn't want to... And I say you need to be in your body, you need to be in the here and now, because the past there's a lot of memories, and the future is a lot of projected thoughts and feelings. But the, 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 the vehicle of reality is being in your body in the here and now, 
with the locus of control for your life in your body, where you are able to have a balance of your critical thinking, your emotional, your intuitive part, your heart, your gut, where you're able to carry yourself and have a meaningful <coughs> life and develop your, your potential. And there's amazing people who've been through the most horrific trafficking and destructive cult uh, childhoods and involvements that are just stellar human beings. Some are public, most are still afraid to say about their past because of the current stigma that still exists, unfortunately. But those people are the models that are so inspirational for others to come out. So I talked about living in the present, in your body, with your locus of control. Emotions are your friends. They tell you stuff. And like you shouldn't allow your friends to control you or dominate you, you shouldn't allow any one emotion to control you either. You're bigger than your emotions. Um, I, uh, so I'm, I, one, one of the big areas of my research started in the 80s. Like I had studied all the persuasion literature and attitude change literature, social psychology literature. But I was still missing something, and when I saw a hypnotist do a trance with somebody, I went, I used to talk like that in the cult. I used to talk like that in the cult. A very special way of talking. Um, anyway, I was like, what's that? I want to know more about that. So I've been studying hypnosis. I, uh, Milton Erickson is the grandfather of modern process-oriented uh, uh, methodology. Tony Robbins took took NLP, which was based on Milton Erickson, and, and started sell, selling it to corporate leaders and salespeople to for the purposes of making money and having power, which drives me crazy. Um, anyway, Claire Frederick was a was a, a psychiatrist who would teach people to do self hypnosis and get in touch with these key parts within themselves of inner wisdom, inner creativity, conscience, to help people plug in to their own resources. Very powerful stuff. Uh, and these are some of the universal needs. And this is an approach. This is back to the first slide where I have deprogramming. Uh, deprogramming is what was done to me in 1976 by force. Uh, hold somebody, it went I illegal. We, they stopped giving um, ex parte conservatorships to parents who are worried about their loved ones. I have a question whether or not we should start allowing those again, especially for families who have a loved one who are getting radicalized into some type of terrorist group. But I developed basically a countermeasure using an ethical group uh, influence program where I get family members, friends, ex-members, other resource people, and I coordinate a systematic program to empower the person to think for themselves and make their own decisions. So it's the exact opposite of destructive mind control. It wants people to be conform and be dependent and obedient. I want people to be themselves. Uh, so that's what my work is about, my books. And now we can do questions and answers, and thank you. And yes, I was on Leah Remini's show, and she won an Emmy. She's the most pop popular former cult member right now on the planet, having been in Scientology for 35 years. And if you, if you, is there anyone in psychiatry that doesn't know that Scientology says all of you are the devils or the evil <laughs> beings on the planet? All of you rape your clients and lobotomize them and drug them and torture them? That, and they have spent millions of dollars programming people with phobias against mental health so that they would go to Scientology instead? Anyway, Leah Remini is wonderful. Yes, sir. Um, might not be, we all be subject to um, uh, s uh, some force that makes us not quite independent of mind. Not the Soviet Union kind of obvious big brother 
propaganda all over the place, total control. So on. But um, hey, um, the constant media-borne messages that you got to buy as much as you can or you won't be happy, or you got to keep up with the Joneses, or uh, in the case of psychiatrists, uh, famously I identified with one school of, um, of psychi uh, psychi um, There are um, psychotherapy, uh, cult-like yeah, type and groups. argued with the other people, and, and the, or, or internists, um, you know, disparaged uh, alternative medicine. The destructive part was to, to deprive patients of effective treatment, like acupuncture, which gradually made it into the mainstream, but, uh, you know, this um, knee-jerk um, re uh, re uh, referral to what you've been taught without criticism. Right, so let me interrupt just for the sake of time and say, um, I frequently had a uh, psychiatrist say, my med school training was really a lot of that bite model stuff, or people who were in the military, etc. And I'm, I'm less interested in calling a thing a cult and more interested about raising consciousness and realizing we are evolving as a species and we better evolve faster. Uh, the, the people who have conscience and who want to have a planet for our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. I want to just say Edward Bernays was a nephew of Freud. He was the first person to apply psychology to business and to politics. He was the one to hire to get women to smoke cigarettes by the tobacco industry. So there's absolute factual basis that there has been a motivation to make money uh, and have more power by using this techniques and this technology. And for me, the solution is teaching everybody about this stuff and uh, as opposed to keeping it just with the, uh, small, the, the small elites who will pay for information. Yes, sir. Um, because you flashed through a few complex PTSD slides, um, when I hear you talk about your shades of electrical behavior therapy, and yeah. shades of cognitive processing. So they did d DBT for years with Laura, and it helped her lower symptoms, but made things worse. How so? Because it didn't acknowledge the dual identity or the unconscious programming that it was really her cult identity that says you have to go back to the one true church or you shouldn't be alive. So that, that's what I want to ask. So could you speak to kind of where, where does bite fit into that framework of thinking about complex trauma and sound just start to answer that question? I think good therapy is really orienting people to their own uniqueness and less to an ideological totalism of any psychotherapy school or methodology. I believe in having a toolkit with lots of different models and lots of different approaches. I use acupuncture too, by the way. Um, and, and there's no one thing that works for everybody. And, and to just, and to, to be focused on what's going to help the largest number of people with the least expense. And that includes really questioning big pharma, oops, I hope I'm not alienating anybody, uh, inculcating doctors to, pres or, or inculcating cost, uh, patients to tell their doctors to prescribe something that they saw on TV, even though there was a long list of side effects uh, that was strategically placed so that it wouldn't go in their conscious mind and, and interfere with them begging their doctor to prescribe it. Um, other comments or questions? Yes. Is there Great question. So there, the question has to do with uh, vulnerabilities of the influencees. Uh, uh, and this is where law enforcement for years has been looking to profile who's vulnerable to ISIS. And they came up with, whoops, we don't know. This model doesn't really work. Because they're not looking at the key feature, which is social influence and undue influence and mind control. Um, Situational vulnerabilities, death of a loved one, illness, moving to a new city, state, or country, graduating, losing a job, breakup in a relationship, those are huge. The single biggest vulnerability is ignorance that this stuff exists. 
How many people needed to tell you, you never give your credit card number to a stranger who has the best stories on the phone, but you never give your credit, I mean, you needed to be taught that, and why, right? And the smart people never did, and the ones who didn't got ripped off, and then they learned, and hopefully they weren't ripped off too badly. But at widespread psychoeducation from middle school on is what is necessary. Uh, going further, I would say somebody who is high hypnotizable is probably going to be more susceptible to hypnotic methodology. Do you know what I mean when I say a high hypnotizable is a bell-shaped curve? A high hypnotizable will be told, imagine you have ice cubes on your hand. And if you measure their temperature, it will actually go down. Or if you tell them you're a warm you know, a, a towel, a hot towel, the temperature will go up. High hypnotizable have that gift. It's really a tremendous gift, but whatever has the power to help has the power to be abused in a bad way. Um, I think people on the spectrum are uniquely vulnerable as well. I actually did a webinar for uh, AANE.org about people, uh, Asperger's and undue influence. It's on the web as well. But um, you got to get over the I'm above that, I'm too smart, or I'm too educated. Get, get over the ego and go, you know what? A lot of really smart, educated people from great families had a unique set of circumstances and it happened to them. And I was just speculating before we started, when we were waiting, that when I first started hearing about the Las Vegas shooter, I'm thinking, Manchurian candidate. Somebody had the cameras to watch him, not just the police. I could be wrong, but he didn't seem to have a profile. But we know that ISIS and other groups have wanted to do Las Vegas in a catastrophic terrorist act. So that's, and, and they did claim credit, but there wasn't that uh, video that's often, uh, or that call that was put in. I don't know, it's early days, but is it possible to program someone to be a Manchurian candidate? In my opinion, I, I would have done it. I know that I would have done it. Because I, I had no capacity to say no, because I didn't want evil spirits to invade me. I was trained to do whatever I was told. Quite other thoughts? Yes? I would have comment. What's refreshing is that you are speaking of do influence. And uh, by analogy, in medicine we often learn pathology, but the real challenge is how do we explain health? Mm. Positive psychology is so refreshing and doing ethical influence is so, thank you for your comment. Um, yeah, I just, in the interest of time, just say yes. Understanding the difference between being, being an ethical practitioner of influence versus, uh, oh, I'm gonna get something out of this. Let me just bend the rules a little here or there. That's when the slippery slope comes in and people get into a lot of trouble. Who hasn't asked a question? Uh, with our patient population, is there, um, do you have any recommendations in terms of how to screen or ask questions or kernels within the history? Great question. So if you're in the ER and somebody's delusional and talking about alien entities, ask them if they've ever been involved with uh, Ron Hubbard or Scientology before you rush to assume that they're delusional and, and rush to medicate them, because they've been programmed against medication and, 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 and institutionalization. And if, and if you familiar, familiarize yourself with some of the bigger cult groups, you can know what words to not use and what to use and not. Um, I wouldn't say, I, have you ever been in a cult? Or you have symptoms that are like a cult? But ask more gentle questions like, tell me more about your childhood or tell me more about your, uh, your faith. Do you have any religious faith of any kind? Did you ever, uh, were you ever part of a high demand, you know, really intense organization or group of people? 
ask about family of origin, because a lot of this comes back to the parents were in some cult, and instead of healthy, encouraging, developmentally appropriate choices as a child, we're telling the kid, always do what I tell you or I'm gonna hit you. And, and creating a false self that's dependent and obedient on them versus, hey, you, my job as a good parent is to be a steward to help you be the best person you can be and let's, you know, let's work this out together. So if that, if that gives a little bit. Yes, sir? It used to be, a, I don't think it still exists. It was this organization called S. So EST, Werner Earhart, who was Jack Rosenberg, who used to sell encyclopedias door to door, left his wife and kids. Later, it turned into Landmark Forum as he was divorcing his third or fourth wife. Landmark Education still continues to this day. They're in corporations. They claim they have nothing to do with Werner. People who've left the organization question that. They're very litigious. And the issue is, um, if, if you're going to go to a seminar or a training, you should know what it's about. If you say, so tell me, I'm going to spend money and spend the weekend. Give me, get, tell me what's going to be covered and what kinds of activities are. Oh, I can't spoil that for you. I don't want to spoil the experience. I'm like, well, go ahead, spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> you. And they're doing a lot of uh, eyes closed. They call them meditations, guided meditations. They don't call it hypnosis, but from my training, it's it's creating altered states of consciousness where their critical think people's critical thinking is offline, and ideas are being put in. The idea that I find reprehensible with that particular organization and ones like it, because there are a lot of splinter groups of that is essentially a version of you are God and you create your own reality. And therefore, if something bad happened to you, like you were raped, you need to go inside and find out why you created that experience for yourself. Because there's no such thing as an accident, there's no such thing as a coincidence. And if you understand why you're a type one diabetic, and you, and, you, and you go inside and you really understand it was about getting attention from your father, you should cure yourself so you won't need insulin anymore. Duh. Um, but there's more. But I mean, there's a lot of large, what we call LGATs, large group awareness trainings. So it's like warning, warning, warning. Yes, sir. Google right now, if you're doing Boolean searches, don't, because the bigger cults are burying all the critical information past the first 10 pa pages, by the way. So it used to be you could go on and get a hit in the first page when the internet started, but now they have too much money, they have too many members, Wikipedia's been completely corrupted from my point of view with cult propaganda. But um, if you have a patient, you can email Freedom of Mind but first do the Google search, name of the group, name of the leader, plus cult, brainwashing, mind control, illegal, scam is a good one, and go 10 deep, go into 100, uh, 100 hits, don't settle for, don't be lazy and do just 10. But you know, if you have rapport with somebody and they know that you genuinely care about them and say, I just really wanna understand you, help me step into your shoes, like, if, if I could be you, tell me what it is that you're missing or what you're needing that will help you get better. Well, just tell me that I was okay to leave my church. Ding, 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 ding. Why? Because I've just told you about phobias and you're inculcated to think that there's no legitimate, you know, relationship with God outside of that particular group. So... And I want to tell you another universal, and that is because the cult identity is programmed against any criticism by the leader, the doctrine, or the group, 
and therefore does thought stopping and has the affect blocking. What I do strategically is talk about my experience and the Moonies, or I pick other groups that aren't attacking their group, educate them sometimes showing them videos and asking their opinion. What do you think about this? Like Leah Remini is bringing a lot of people out of the woodwork from other cults. That's just like my group. I wasn't allowed to talk to my family and friends when I left, or I, I wasn't allowed to, to read critical literature or whatever. So a lot of people are surfacing, but the problem is there's no mental health professionals trained to help them. This is a specialized kind of problem. This isn't just take a, take a pill and come back next week. This is a, a, an intense, is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? Yep. So there's so much more to talk about, but we are hardwired to follow who we perceive to be legitimate authority figures, as we're hardwired to follow social groups that of people we identify with. And but we need that extra knowledge and critical thinking to be able to step out, go meta, and reality test, and gather more information. And teaching clients, you can always get a second opinion or a third opinion. Let me let me refer you to another another colleague, not someone in your camp, but someone truly from another camp, get another opinion. Maybe there's something that I'm missing, because I want to help you get better as quickly as, as you can. Last word. Um, you have to get a nonprofit um, uh, foundation to raise uh, research funds. Yes, this is a valid PSM-5 condition. Uh, wouldn't uh, the <laughs> normal um, funders uh, be ready to fund you? So one of the major people, uh, Michael Commons, who's part of the program in psychiatry and the law, literally sat me down and said, Steve, you need a nonprofit where people can donate money to do this research. So I, he's allowed me to create a division within his existing nonprofit called freedomfromunduinfluence.org. So we have a bank account, and it's a 501c3, but I don't yet have the people who can do grant writing and say, help, let's do this. Why don't you uh, ask the NIA? I don't know how. It's a quick the answer. On the website? It's, not, the it's not my field. Department if you of know anyone who can help, that would be great. Department of Defense. So I'm going to end on this, um, and I can stay longer if people want to, but my story, I think, the reason why I haven't been picked up by the military, and I have been approached by the CIA back in the 70s three different times, but I talk about the CIA setting up the Korean CIA and the founder of the Korean CIA during the Congressional Subcommittee investigation of 76 to 78 that was looking into Korean influence in the US. The founder of the Korean CIA said that he he organized and utilized the Unification Church for use as a political tool because they were worried about North Korean brainwashing, so they wanted to have an alternative for South Korean re-education. And it was only when we were withdrawing from Vietnam and et cetera that this was imported to the US. I was recruited at Queens College and it was brought to the United States. So I put that all in chapter two. I'm out there, like I'm a human rights advocate, and I don't think anyone from the government wants to touch that because no, no official has ever said, oh yeah, we mind control exists. Yes, you can do this to somebody. Um, after, after Jonestown happened, if you remember Congressman Ryan was murdered, um, there was a congressional investigation. They did a whole subcommittee report on the brainwashing tactics of Jim Jones. Um, 
I was asked to come to Capitol Hill to testify with, with Grace Stone, who was a survivor of Jonestown. And then we arrived, and all the cults were out picketing, you know, repeal the, the First Amendment, elect Bob Dole president, and all the ex-members were taken off, and cult leaders were invited to speak about Jonestown. I went, huh, there's a whole political thing here that's really wiggly. And here I am 41 years later. So thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.